Hello Pet World and welcome to another edition of Natural Pets TV. I'm Robert Semro and I am joined by two wonderful pet experts in the natural path world. That's right, Heidi Nevela and Greg Tilford. Guys, thanks for joining me. Thank you. This Thank you. is an important topic and something all of us are dealing with on a daily basis. And that is preventing and confronting chronic illnesses and the environment and the impact it has on a daily basis for our pets. It is very important and it's something, you know, I take really dear to my heart. It seems so simple. But the truth is, you know, and not, this isn't just my opinion, this is the opinion of many hundreds of veterinarians I work with, holistic veterinarians that will agree that probably 80% of all the chronic illness in companion animals is directly related, if not completely caused, by bad human behaviors. Mm -hmm. Wow. And now, what are some of the common things that we're encountering as well as our pets? Because we're all symbiotic in this relationship. Well, one of the things that is manifesting big time, and it's not just our pets, but in our human children, are endocrine disrupting diseases, you know, endos end the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals, endocrine disease. We're seeing also the effects uh, manifesting as autism and all kinds of things that are associated with these exogenous chemicals, meaning chemicals that come from outside of our body in our environment that we could have control over. It starts under the kitchen sink. Um, when I was in my 20s, I roomed with a, a hazmat guy from LA Fire Department, and he said one of their biggest worries in that job was under the kitchen sink. You know, wow. there's some of the cleaners that are more carcinogenic than, you know, the stuff with the big placards you see in, <laughs> in trucks with guard cars. I mean, really, there's stuff in our environment that we're putting into our environment on our lawns, on our carpets, all around the house that is causing chronic disease, not just in our animals, but in ourselves. And the list goes on. Bad foods, food preservatives, uh, food colorings that, are, that have been shown to have toxic effects upon us. And we have to remember that the animals in our lives, they're living on an accelerated lifespan. Mm -hmm. So the things that are affecting them the same way they're affecting us, it's happening faster for them. So they're succumbing to the same things. And we can control that. That's up to us. That's our behavior. It's not their fault. And, you know, for those of us that really love our animals and are willing to step beyond our own comfort systems and acknowledge the truth of this, we can make a big difference in, in helping to prevent chronic disease and improve the world we live in. I think one of the, there's so many studies now that are linking uh, maybe in, in an inflammatory way for some people, but vaccinations with, in, in humans with autism, but vaccinosis in pets. Um, and then you're talking about metabolic disorders and lo even low level interrupters and GMO foods. There's links between that and processed food is, is widely fed to dogs and cats. So it's one of the sources, but there's so many. So you're talking about kitchen sink. Then we, if we walked into a, an average room and started assessing the chemical makeup of carpets or the flooring, the walls, the, the, the contaminants and the chemicals in it, let alone our food and our water supplies, then we get a bigger picture of what's happening in our pets' bodies and why, like you're saying, shorter lifespan, greater manifestation of disease rates than it was 10 years ago, especially cancers. Um, then we start understanding that this is not just happening, it, it's been accumulating. So you're talking about a chronic problem. Right. It's under ongoing. And the, 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 whole, the whole picture, it's insidious. The mm -hmm. endocrine disruption issue, basically what these chemicals do is when ingested, they don't necessarily have a profound immediate effect upon the person that consumes them or ingests them, but it has an effect upon the chromosomes of that individual. So it's passed through generations. And we're just starting to see the effects of, um, I think we will start to see the effects of spot on, you know, flea killers and such, mm -hmm. because they're definitely, they're made, you know, imidacloprid and all these different chemicals they use, they show that they don't necessarily harm the host, the mammalian host, but it's pretty well proven that they damage chromosomes and they affect thyroid. And so the offspring, generation, two generations down the road, we're gonna see problems manifesting. And well, and you're not saying, that anybody's out there, when, when you talk about ingesting it, it's because of the environment that we're all living yes. in. The pets are walking through it, yes. the pets groom themselves, right. that's the common way that's happening. Excellent point, another good perspective you just brought up is, you know, we walk above what's sprayed on our lawn. Right. Our dogs and our cats, they walk with their face in it all the time and then lick it off their paws. Exactly. So they've got really close up personal exposure to all these things that we just kind of say, oh, they're benign because we don't see immediate results in us in humans. But you know, I've, I've had 
I don't. I lost count of how many cats I've had in my life. I've probably in the neighborhood of 20. I've had eight dogs and such, and I'm just starting to really kind of figure out that wow, I've, I've been watching them die or suffer from a lot of influences that are the result of bad human behaviors. And I mean, those bad human behaviors also include, you know, conveniences, <laughs> the quality of ingredients or lack of quality of ingredients that go into some of the commercial pet foods, byproducts, meat meals, mm -hmm. you know, things that are made from road killed or euthanized pets, you know, and, and you know, tumors cut off of animals' carcasses in the, the slaughterhouse process. The list goes on of what we allow or what we've allowed as, as a people, as a species, to go into the mouths of these animals that we now regard as integral members of our families. I mean, and it has to stop. And fortunately, in the audiences that I speak to, and I speak all over the world, I'm seeing a change. There's a paradigm shift. People are getting right. it. They're taking it to heart. It's you also know. happening to them. And it's happening So when it's to happening them. to them and they can trace it back to their home environments or to their just environment, whether when we're talking about home, we're talking about, you know, living or living spaces, but we're also talking about the whole world. Right. And how do you know how difficult is it to find a chemical free space to share? Um, and when we start looking at, at how most animal wellness is presented or has been with all of the chemical interventions like vaccinations and synthetic medications, whether they're flea and heartworm and tick medications and um, the anti-vaccinations, which we don't get as humans anymore. We, you know, they're optional. They, they are annually re-vaccinated, re living shorter lifestyle or lifespans and, and it's starting to add up. And then we have to look, we talk about food and water. Our water has fluoride in it and other chemicals that they're not supposed to be metabolizing. Right. So when you're, t then, and metabolic disorders is, is a direct result of those kind of chemical contaminants. And you know, and a lot of it has to do with the way it's been presented to us. I mean, if there's one thing that America's good at, it's capitalism, mm -hmm. you know? And we look at vaccinations and there's, it's a heated controversy. It's a, it's a three hour subject for me. <laughs> right. But you have to also question, why am I giving it? For instance, if you live uh, in, in the top of a, a skyscraper in New York City on Manhattan Island and you have a Persian cat that never steps outside yeah. and you're vaccinating for everything but rabies, mm -hmm. rabies being the only <laughs> legally required vaccination mm -hmm. in the United States, to my knowledge, right. um, you have to question, why am I doing it? Just because maybe it will prevent something down the road and you also have to consider what are the ramifications of over-vaccinating an animal. You know, in my mind, and it, it, like I said, it's a heated subject, if they work as well as they are supposed to, you shouldn't have to give them over and over and over again. I heard that one of the reasons why rabies is given every two to three years is because the test animals that were used to develop the drug are only kept alive for two to three years. Hmm. And therefore, the rationale is, well, you better revaccinate. That's what I've heard from you know, a lot of different sources. So it needs to be reconsidered. We need to take responsibility. You know, we can't point fingers toward industry. We can't point fingers toward the neighbor. We can't point fingers, you know, at anybody but ourselves. We're responsible for the health of our animals, nobody else. Right. And well, the trade-off is, is that we're gonna be healthier too. Right, well, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about vaccinations and, and whatnot, we have an option because I think that's one area where we go, well, I have to do it because I, you know, the boarding facility requires these or my, you know, so-and-so requires that. But there are things out there that we can do, in particular, titer testing. Mm -hmm. And that's just not a common thing, mm -hmm. unfortunately. You've got to, as you said, take charge, lead the discussion and say, before I do this, I want a titer test to see if it's needed. And even afterwards, do another one and see if it had the effect it was supposed to have. Right. Because nothing worse than I'm giving him something and it doesn't work anyway. Right. So it's... Uh, Become yeah. informed. But these discussions know? weren't necessarily had, a, you know, five years ago, ten years ago. Right. And now there's so much more information out there and the demand is, again, I, I think that connection between human health and manifestation of disease and animal health and manifestation. They're, they're you know, synergistic, they're interconnected. And that's why we're getting this out now. There's a platform and a need for the inf and yeah. a desire for the information. So it's not like you said, it's not pointing fingers at pet parents who simply were were following the direction of their professional veterinarian, who, in a lot, lot of cases, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But now, now it's just there's too many numbers of animals dying from cancer at number one right. cause at age ten, of dogs, 
um, it's now there's too much mounting evidence that we have to step back from the, the chemical application or the chemical process and insert something natural in or at least something to improve balance because immunity is lost and the whole structures arrive for our animals in terms of wellness. Yeah, and we have to take it beyond the chemical aspect, the physical aspect of well-being too. I mean, dogs are, you know, I, I won't mention cats here because, you know, cats have the attitude of, I'm a cat and you're not, you know. <laughs> but dogs are so linked to their humans. They're emotionally linked. I mean, you're God to them, mm -hmm. and you know, and- My cats are like that with me. And, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the are. emotional <laughs> environment in the house affects them. Right, right. I mean, I get calls, I've gotten calls, people, you know, asking me, what do I give to my, my dog, he's a nervous wreck, and I, I just, you know, and <laughs> you know, my, my husband doesn't do anything for him, we fight all the time, and, you know, and <laughs> exactly. you wonder why the bird's pulling out its feathers, right. and the cat, cat is chewing its fur out, and it all affects them. And right we have to look at ourselves in a big way to really bring them into wellness. If the environment isn't well, then the things that live inside of the environment probably aren't gonna be well it, either. It's interesting how many stereotypes play into that scenario too, like it's just a dog or it's just a cat. And, and even just the cat-dog relationships, I know it, it depends on the breed and, and on the person too, but those, those incredibly deeply uh, can, those deep connections where they're mimicking your behavior. Cats can learn to mimic facial expressions or respond to them, whereas it was just thought that dogs could. There's all this study, all this information, how intricately wound they are in our emotions and um, our physical actions. So that and that, how that, like you're saying, if I'm a neurotic mess at home, my animals probably will be too. Or if there's imbalance yeah. or unhappiness or un, untreated stress, or even just behaviorally, how I'm responding to them in disciplinary situations, I'm not consistent, or, you know, it, you, that's where I really have to step back as a pet parent and say, okay, I'm guilty, I need well, to Well, you've also got to look at, at that home environment. At certain points, I've got young kids, they do things, they leave things around, easy for the dogs to get into. I go to other folks' houses, maybe they're smoking, mm -hmm. whatever. All mm -hmm. of those things are getting into the systems, and we're talking about smaller bodies, smaller right. systems that process things much differently, and we don't have the decades and decades of research that we do for the humans on the pets. I mean, it's getting there, but all that stuff factors in, and, and so, you know, one of my favorite things um, is a good friend of mine, Denise Fleck, talks about getting down on the floor like your pet mm -hmm. and seeing it from their level. Absolutely. And, and it is, and it's interesting because, as you mentioned, whatever's going on in your house, whatever you're reflecting, they're reflecting right mm -hmm. back to us. And spend some time trying to imagine how they perceive their world. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, because it's going to be way different than us. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, they... They, they live from a state of innocence that we'll never get, mm -hmm. you know. They, they, they live through the eyes of innocence, and it's different. So when they see, you know, us behaving a certain way, they, they don't get it, and they're confused, right. and, and, you know, and, and it all just, it, again, it boils back to heal thyself mm -hmm. if you want to heal something else. It's part of the big picture. It's part, we're, we're all in this together. It's, it, the earth is not just a third rock rotating around the sun, it's a living being covered with all these different organisms that are supposed to work cooperatively toward each other's existence, and we're the <laughs> square peg in a, in a round hole here. We're the ones that wow. don't fit. And so by looking at what these animals are bringing to us, the lessons, and doing the work that we have to do for them to bring them to wellness by understanding the way they are, we're going to find out a lot of things about ourselves that we're going to want to change. And I guarantee that it's you know it's going to work toward this this show obviously this whole idea of holistic animal care it's way bigger than what to give Fido for his skin condition it's way bigger than what to feed it's 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 about working with animals to heal or heal heal the well, healer I had a healer to heal the greater the greater planet the, the right. greater bio community that lives here and that's us the animals. Everybody, everything, the foods we eat, the plants, mm -hmm. it's all interconnected. And the animals give us a very unique opportunity to- Well, uh, and I, I think what we've been talking about here is awareness. Be aware of the environment. Be aware of what your pets are experiencing. Secondhand smoke. Yeah, get yeah. down, take stock of what's going in and around you, not only in the house, but outdoors, in the backyard, wherever your pets are spending most of their time. Take a look at it 
and see what things that you can change. So often now we have natural alternatives mm -hmm. that we can be using instead of the chemical heavy solutions that we've used in the past. Create a healthier environment, not only for your pets, but you're gonna be creating it for yourself as well. And again, it's symbiotic. What we get from our pets is what we give to them. Thanks for joining us here on Natural Pets TV. Financial and other considerations have been provided by Animal Essentials, Natura Pets Organics, the National Animal Supplement Council, and the Well Dog Place. Hey, pet parents, thanks for joining us. I gotta say, we are covering a lot of great topics, but I wanna hear from all of you. What things do you want our experts to be talking about, educating and sharing with you? Put that in the comments section down below. In the meantime, if you want more information about my good friend, Greg Tilford, you can get that at theanimalherbalist.com or at animalessentials.com or from my other good friend, Heidi Nevela, visit naturapetswithaz.com. And as always, you can find us at PetWorldInsider.com.